This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Wednesday, April 29th, 2020. I'm Caleb Brown. Why have countries like South Korea and Japan performed so well at battling the coronavirus while Western countries, most especially the United States, have failed to contain it or even really slow its spread? Cato's Terence Keeley believes it comes down to the role of science in society. We spoke last week. There is a vibrant debate among people about which countries appear to have performed well, uh, which countries appear to have performed poorly uh, in this COVID-19 pandemic that we've had across the globe. If you uh, are a Twitter person, and I uh, regrettably am a Twitter person, there's a chart that made the rounds numerous times. And it is simply, if you look at the doubling rate of the illness Uh, the countries that stand out, Japan and South Korea, and people will draw a big circle around Japan and South Korea and say, masks. And then they show the chart doubling at a a much faster rate uh, in countries like the United States and elsewhere, uh, the circle that and say, no masks. And that's obviously oversimplifying things, but uh, to what extent can we attribute Uh, culture to uh, the differences in how countries have dealt with this illness? I think masks are about the least important thing. Uh, And I think culture is pretty unimportant. And I think the most successful country is Taiwan, by the way. Taiwan has recorded days this month without a single case. But yes, of course, the great successes are in East Asia. And the great failures, I'm afraid, are in the West, and the United States of America and the United Kingdom are amongst the worst performing countries. So the question is why? And it's much more sophisticated than masks, and yet much, much simpler. So you've simply got to do a timeline. On January the 27th, when South Korea had recorded a total of four cases The authorities called together in Seoul, the capital, the 20 leading biotech companies in South Korea, and said, we want you to develop a test as soon as possible. They were able to do that because the Chinese government had informed the World Health Organization that they had this disease, and a Chinese scientist in Shanghai had published the sequence of the virus on January the 10th. If you have a sequence of the RNA of the virus, you can create a test. And so on the 27th of January, as I said, South Korean authorities get 20 biotech companies together. By February the 4th, the first biotech company has produced a test. The authorities in Korea accredit it within a single day, an amazing act of speed. By the end of February, there are four separate tests on the market in South Korea, but more to the point, By February the 7th, the Korean authorities are now testing everybody who is possibly a suspect. With the result, and the same story in Taiwan and other Far Eastern countries, with the result that the disease is crushed before it starts. There is no question as to which countries have been most successful. It's Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, and the other countries of the Far East. Not because of masks, masks will have done no harm but because of something much simpler. They started testing the moment they got their first cases. Uh, And uh, as importantly, uh, the hurdles to getting tests, making tests available were done away with almost instantly. The regulatory process was instantaneous and very, very impressive. Uh, But that was because, of course, everything was being directed from the top, the South Korean president was very clear uh, as the urgency of the situation. The vice president of Taiwan, as everyone knows, is an epidemiologist, and so it goes on. But it's more than that. Uh, What was going on in those Far Eastern countries, not just a very, very sensitive government apparatus aware of the need to deal with this, but also a huge biotech sector. One of the things we have all overlooked in the West is that the Far Eastern countries have about twice as much research and development as we do in the West as a percentage of GDP. 
and is almost all private, whereas, of course, as we know, governments fund a lot of research in the West. And so what happened when this crisis broke is that the governments had a vibrant, huge biotech industry in each of these countries simply to tap. They called them together and said, we want you to develop these tests in your company laboratories immediately, and we see our job only as getting the regulatory process accelerated. So this was a terrific triumph in the Far East of private free market science. The United States did not take advantage of the tests that had been developed in these countries. Why not? There were there two or three reasons for that. One of them, I'm afraid, does go right to the very top of the United States. Um, Barack Obama, building on the legacy of George W. Bush, so this is not partisan, this is a bipartisan remark. George W. Bush was very well aware of the dangers of pandemics, and Barack Obama was very well aware of the dangers of pandemics. And Barack Obama had established in the National Security Council a pandemic unit, not just to lead America's response to the next pandemic, to lead the world's response. Barack Obama saw the United States as the essential nation. He knew, we all knew, this is hardly mysterious, that pandemics are absolutely inevitable. There would be another one. After all, in the last 15 years, we've had SARS, we've had MERS, we've had Ebola, and of course, there's still AIDS. And so Barack Obama had established in the National Security Council the world's pandemic center. And this, I'm afraid, was degraded, decapitated, done away with, reduced in size, marginalized two years ago by Donald Trump. And that was perhaps the single most grave blow to the security of Americans and people around the globe that we've witnessed in the last couple of years. So what of the relationship between the public sector and the private sector when it comes to scientific inquiry? What's, what's different about uh, countries like Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, versus the United States or most of Europe? There's a very fundamental cultural difference. It's a very good question. And I'll put it in a sentence. In Taiwan and the Far East, the culture is that the job of science is to help society. So there is practically no government funding of research in those countries. Research is left entirely to the private sector where it flourishes. I mean, there's twice as much research there as there is in the West. So it certainly flourishes in the private sector. And the job of the government, and it sees itself simply to tap that science in the public interest when necessary. But our culture in the West is it's the job of society to support science. And so we have all these huge programs, NSF, NIH, ARPA, it goes on and on and on, by which the governments of the West tax their people to support science whereas the governments in the East do not tax their people. It's industry that supports science, and very successfully, and the government simply taps that science when there's a national need. As of this recording, it was just two days ago that the FDA approved an at-home COVID-19 test, and some states those tests are, are still illegal. Um, and the tests that were being developed by, I forget, either the CDC or the FDA, probably the, the CDC, uh, they discovered early on that they were doing a, a bad job of developing a test. They violated some protocols, and the tests ultimately uh, failed. Uh, so you know, where do we go from here in trying to uh, manage events like this? Well, there are two answers to this. First of all, on the subject of tests, uh, you only have to look at what happened in South Korea. South Korea produced so many tests so early that there was no nonsense about doing it at home. There were public test drive-in sites all over the country. These were based on McDonald's, they were based on Starbucks, and they were, of course, free. Any individual in South Korea could drive up to these places and get a free test. And so, that was a test performed by professionals without the dangers of false positives and false negatives. And the way 
all civilized countries should go is by having tests performed in professional labs under these circumstances. The really interesting question is why has America and the West diverged from the model of successful science that they have in the East? And the answer goes back to one episode, namely Sputnik. What we forget is that throughout the whole of the 19th century and the 20th centuries until very recently in America and in Britain, and indeed the 18th century in Britain, science was run the way it is in South Korea and Taiwan and Japan and Singapore today. It was left to the private sector, and the government did not involve itself in science except for so-called mission science where a government says, well, this is a public mission on behalf of society, such as, for example, a pandemic, or in those days, getting advances in latitude and longitude, which was seen as public goods. All that changed in America in 1957, when Sputnik was launched. And what happened at that point was a real panic that overtook not just America, but England and the whole of the Western world, that the Russians were going to overtake. And so in 1958, a very interesting experiment was performed. The United States government created NASA. It created the Higher Education Defense Act, which is all about putting money into universities. And it created ARPA, the Advanced Research Programs Agency. What the Americans did in 1958 is to start funding pure science to create economic growth, because that's what the Soviets were doing. In 1969, the Defense Department published Project Hindsight, and this was, as the name suggests, a hindsight exercise. And it looked back on all the research that the government had funded in pure science and found it was of no benefit. And this had a huge impact on America because you took ARPA, which had all these pure scientists, and you closed down the pure science. And all the pure scientists at ARPA were made redundant. So where did they go? They went to what we now call Silicon Valley. They went to work for a company called Xerox at Park, Palo Alto Research Park, and there they created the personal computer. It is absolutely true that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and others went to Xerox Park and got their ideas from that. And the important point is this. It happened because America closed all the pure labs, made the pure scientists redundant, and forced them to work in industry. And it's industry that produces wealth. And it's the same in the Far East. They never made the mistake there of thinking that governments should fund pure science. They understood that that was the role of industry. And so when this crisis hit, it was actually much easier for government in the East than it was for the West, because they simply had to ask scientists in industry to do what they were already prepared to do. The East had the industrial infrastructure. We in the West didn't, because the government funding of science, which of course has since been resuscitated in the West, has crowded out all the scientists, driven them out of the private sector into the public sector, and left the private sector, which is where you get vaccines and all these other tests from, denuded of the talent that in Korea and Japan and Taiwan is where you want the talent making your new tests. Terence Keeley is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast wherever you please and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast. 